Hello and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for joining us today. We're going to talk about Bearded Irises 101. And again, I'm Bonnie Nichols and I live in Dallas, Texas. Um, in Dallas, we're in climate zone eight. So that kind of tells you uh, we get pretty pretty warm here in the summers. So the 101 I want to talk about um, bearded irises. Most of us know that are relatively easy garden plants to grow, and they'll give us great results with minimum care. They are probably the most hardiest perennial that I know of, and yes, I grow a lot of daylilies also. But anyway, they're very hardy plants. Uh, we all know that the better the culture, the more magnificent the display. So I want to take an opportunity here to um, use my laser pointer. And let's talk about the different parts of the iris, the bearded iris. So we have the standards here. We have three of those. We have three of the falls. We have the style crest that sits inside of the standards. We have the stamen, we have the stigma, and we have the half. And the half is the narrowest part of, of the fall. The last piece I want to talk about is the beard. And the beard can be a very nice focal point. The beard can be the same color as the fall, or in this case, it's a beautiful gold tone ending in a very nice like a lavender blue purple here at the end. So these are bearded iris rhizomes that are ready to be replanted. You can tell that they're freshly dug. They, the leaves have been trimmed. We always trim the leaves on a perennial when you're going to replant it. You've shocked that plant, so we want to give them a nice trim before we replant them. You notice that the rhizomes here uh, look like potatoes, actually. Um, then they've got all the little small roots coming down from them. All of these roots will die, and new roots will develop when we replant them. And I hope you can see these very small plants here that are emerging from the side of those rhizomes. Those are going to be future plants for us. So with the bearded irises, uh, when we go to purchase irises, um, we should look for irises that have high bud count. So if you're looking online or if you're looking in a catalog, Look and see how many buds that each one of the um, iris plants should have on each stalk. And then also look for something that has outstanding branching. And we're going to talk about some of that a little bit later on. So then you need to decide what type of bearded irises that would grow best for your climate zone. Again, I mentioned in Dallas, we are, we are slap dab in the middle of zone eight. Um, again, so we get very warm. So the first class of irises I just want to mention is the MDBs, which is miniature dwarf bearded irises. And they don't grow very well for us here because we just don't get cold enough. And there are a lot of the cumula breeding um, back to the species in this, so we just don't get cold enough. But if, they, um, if, if we did purchase those and you purchase those, um, they would have a stalk up to eight inches tall. They're one of the earliest uh, bearded irises to bloom. So you'd want to plant those at the front of your landscape. Then next we have the SDBs, which are the standard dwarf bearded irises. Those stalks get a little bit taller. They actually could be double the size of the MDB, and they bloom very, very early. Then you have the intermediate bearded irises, bloom stalks 16 to 27 and a half inches, so we're getting taller. They also bloom early to mid-season in the spring. So we have the border bearded, and look, that bloom stalk is the very same height as the intermediate bearded, but they bloom a little bit later with the tall bearded irises. Then we have the miniature tall bearded irises. Again, we've got that same stalk height as the IBs and the border bearded, and they also bloom mid-season. You may be more familiar with the term of table irises. Back in the 30s and 40s, they were used a lot for cut flowers. Um, and mostly called table irises. Then the last class, which is 
probably the most popular class will be the tall bearded irises. Again, a bloom stalk even taller than 27 and a half inches. They can be maybe 40, 42 plus inches tall. And they bloom all the way from early to late season. So let's take a picture of um, some of those different uh, classes of irises. And you can see where the miniature dwarf, you'd want to plant that at the front of your landscape and then gradually increase the size of the stalks and you would plant the tall bearded probably a little bit further back in your landscape. Now we will talk about the steps to a beautiful iris garden. I get questions from time to time um, from irisarians that ask me, when do I plant bearded irises? Most of us will plant our irises in July, August, and September. I know in Dallas we have two sales, one in August and one in September, and we tell our clients in the August sale that it's very, very hot, particularly over 100 degrees, so we recommend that they maybe, if they can't plant them right then, where well, we can get a little bit of shade, that they just spread them out on some newspaper or brown paper sacks or something in a spare bedroom. But we do plant um, at least in September. So normally you would plant a perennial opposite of bloom season. Just always kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So you would divide and replant your irises that have become overcrowded, usually in three to five years. And I'll show you some pictures of what I'm talking about. So it's important that the roots of newly planted irises be well established before your first killing freeze or frost. And again, for us, that would be sometime in November. Um, so anyway, you want to give them enough time to establish new roots because as I mentioned earlier, all those little roots that you saw on those cut iris rhizomes uh, will all die and new roots will be developing. Then I get questions about where do I plant the bearded irises? And I always tell people that they need as much sun as you can possibly give them, but at least a half a day of sun, which it would be six to eight hours of direct sunlight. So some afternoon shade is beneficial in extreme hot climates like, you know, Arizona, Southern California, Texas, um, you know, where we can get very, very warm for an extended period of time. Um, irises will grow in deep shade, just unfortunately, uh, they will not flower or there will not be much bloom whatsoever. Always provide irises with good drainage. The bearded irises do not like wet feet. They have to have good drainage. So you can consider a raised bed, and I'm going to show you some pictures of that, or you can plant on a slope, which would be ideal because, again, the water would not stand um, in the iris bed. So this is a picture of an iris garden um, west of Fort Worth. It's actually Mena Wells, the Clark Garden. And you Texans can probably tell this is West Texas because we've got the mesquite trees and the mistletoe there. But um, again, they're in full sun. They do very, very well, even in extended periods of very hot weather. So I always tell people the very first thing that you should think about is your soil. And it's best to always remove all the existing weeds um, in your potential flower bed because even the smallest of weed roots um, will come back to haunt you and they will regrow and then you've got more weeds to have to deal with. So anyway, be sure that you start out fresh with great soil and a weed-free uh, iris bed. So try to dispose weeds anytime that you're in the garden or in your yard um, by removing them. Don't put them in your compost, but remove them from the area because you don't want any uh, seeds and so forth from the weeds to come back. Now, in our area, the soil that we feel like is the best is a mixture of two-thirds screened sandy loam. And I put that in quotes because you, you get what you pay for. So you need to get screened sandy loam because you'll have fewer nutgrass seeds. And that's what you want is you're trying to get all those seeds um, out of that sandy loam. And then you'll put a one third of combined wheat straw manure and pine bark mulch. And I use the fine pine bark mulch. So uh, compost is a key word. 
and you want to make sure that it is not hot uh, because that will burn your plant. So you want to make sure that it's well uh, decomposed. So anyway, talk to your local garden center, and they probably have a landscape mix that would be perfect for your iris garden. Again, in Texas, we have clay soil. So you can amend the clay soil, but you have to be prepared that it just takes time. And that time can, you know, you can do soil amendments like gypsum and so forth, but it can take several years uh, to ever break down that clay soil. But the irises, believe it or not, do very, very well in clay soil. Uh, the clay is more difficult to work with. We know if it gets very wet or very dry, you almost need a jackhammer to sizzle through some of that clay soil. But the irises do very well. Um, the, the pH in clay soil for us is a little bit acidic. It loves that. Um, so anyway, but before you do any amendments to your soil, I'd just spend a little bit of money and have my soil tested. So I always get the question about mulch. And you can see um, this is, again, at the Clark Garden in Mineral Well, Texas. And they do mulch. Um, they compost their own mulch and so forth for the garden but they keep it away from the base of the iris plants. And that's very, very important because you don't want water to collect right around the base of the bearded irises or you will introduce rot into your plants. So again, if you use mulch, I would spread it very thin and make sure, I can't repeat this enough, uh, keep the mulch away from, from the base of the plant. So this is a sample of a, a very healthy iris clump that has been dug. Again, they have trimmed the foliage here. Um, you can see they have washed it very, very well. You see the nice white roots. Everything looks very healthy. But notice the here. You can tell that this is the part of the rhizome that was above the soil line. It's been bleached a little bit by the sun. And from here, this area, you can tell this is what was under the soil because it's much darker. So you want to leave the top part of the rhizome just a little bit exposed um, and not plant that too deep because some people think you have to plant the iris rhizome all the way up to where the foliage begins. If you do that and it rains or, you know, it just gets very, very hot, then you will introduce rot into the garden. And I'll show you some uh, information about that. So if you want to plant a raised bed, they look very nice. They look, they look nice in your landscape. And if you'll notice this garden here, they have a drip irrigation. And that's a great setup that these people have uh, because if you possibly can water your bearded irises with drip, it certainly makes them much happier than having overhead water because when you overhead water, you water gets down inside the leaves again that can sit there and then introduce rot. So let's talk about planting your irises. Um, there's three easy steps to planting the bearded irises. So you can say, see on the on the left here, this person started out some very healthy looking garden soil, and you mound um, the soil up in the center. And then you take your iris rhizome, you spread the roots out, and you put that rhizome on top of the mound that you've made here in the soil. You can see this foliage has been cut back to a nice, healthy length. And then you, once you plant the iris, you will make sure that you fully pack the soil down, just like you would a bedding plant. You don't want any air pockets in there. So if it's stomping on it with your foot or whatever, just make sure you pack it down very, very uh, tight. Now, this iris, um, you can tell, was freshly dug, freshly trimmed. Um, good chance it will bloom this next season. If you get some of the irises that are very dried, maybe they've been dug, I don't know, six months or so, you know, chances are you throw those things in the soil and they're going to grow, but you may have lost one year worth of bloom if they're that dry. Sometimes it just takes them a little bit longer. I get questions about spacing of plants. And some people uh, would like a nice clump that first and second year. And if that's part of your landscape plan, then this is a nice design. Um, so we've got some triangles here. You notice that the plants are 
code in there so the the base of the rhizome is planting to, is uh, planted toward the inside of the triangle and that will make you a nice clump of irises so those are good sized rhizomes they're freshly dug uh, so they should just pick up and and give you again a nice bloom for next spring and i would plant these about 12 to 24 inches apart no more than that uh, especially that first year again let's talk a little bit about watering the irises i can't stress enough over watering is a common mistake because you know they don't take the water that your bedding plants would or some other type of plant so when the soil dries out then water them um, you've watered them when you first planted them and then i wouldn't water them and, and you know when you've got a big commercial garden there's just absolutely no way that i can water all those irises overhead or drip so it's survival of the fittest and i think that's what you want i don't think you want an iris that you have to pamper and take care of and you know hover over all the time and take your temperature and everything i think it needs to be a very hardy perennial so keeping the weeds away you can use a pre-emergent herbicide you can use a post-emergent herbicide or you can not use either one and we're going to talk about those but if you use a pre-emergent herbicide normally they're going to be in a, a granular type of a herbicide be very very careful not to get the herbicide near the iris root so again when you're when you're applying your herbicide don't broadcast that where you can get that herbicide inside the leaves so just be very careful keep it away from the very base of the plant. If you do use a pre-emergent, something like preen or whatever, then you could use that very early in the season and then I would, I would stop and then use it after bloom season because it could cause some distortion with number of segments on your irises or discoloration or something. So you can also use a post-emergent herbicide. Um, if you do, chances are those are in liquid form most of the time. Um, do not get that near your iris or, you know, you could kill the plant. So some of the herbicides are designed to kill grasses that would be safe in your flower beds. So before you go out there and just spray a herbicide on your entire garden, you might just pick a, a small area, you know, do a test area, just kind of like you do if you're going to, um, you know, get a stain out of your clothes or something like that. You know, just be very, very careful with it. Um, one suggestion is if you have to use a post-emergent liquid uh, spray herbicide that you cover the plant and then put the herbicide directly on the leaves of the weed. And again, if you don't have very many irises, this is definitely an option for you. But if you have, you know, 100, 200, 300 irises, you can imagine that would be an overwhelming task. Um, this is an example of no herbicides. And you can see probably at least six, maybe more, uh, different types of weeds that, you know, this gardener has their hands full because you can tell these are pretty uh it must be in the spring because you can see this foliage it looks pretty good so far but won't if you leave all these weeds around the plant and then that just that can create more and more issues for you so if you do not use herbicides there are options and those options are good old just weeding the garden and these are a couple of tools that uh, we find helpful this one over here kind of looks like a chisel but it's got two different blades on it which works very nice and then this is a scuffle hoe or a hula hoe. You might know it by a couple of different names, but it does very, very well to remove the weeds and remove the weeds close to your iris plants. Now, the two tools on the left, labeled A and B, these are my go-to garden tools. Love them. Um, I can get them on the internet for 10 to 12, maybe $15 is very most. They definitely last me a season or two because I, I lose a couple of them in the garden um, but besides that they do a great job and especially getting in between the iris rhizomes and in the weeds 
And then here's just another garden tool here. It's one I've not necessarily used, but I think would be a definitely suitable. So this is um, an area of the fertilizer we want to talk about. Um, definitely avoid fertilizer that's high in nitrogen. Only thing the nitrogen is going to do is encourage soft growth, and then that's going to encourage disease. Also, it may be uh, something that you think would be a great idea to use something like a feed in weed type thing. So one hall does all. Um, so you can weed the irises and you can also um, feed them at the same time, but that's not a good idea around the irises. Again, same thing with the herbicides and same thing with the mulch, just keep it away from the base of the iris plant. Now, when you're planting new irises, Osmocote is what we like to use, just a small handful, and it's a time-release fertilizer, so uh, that should do very well for a new iris plant. Um, once you're established, um, then we use Osmocote or we use something the like 888 or 101010. Um, again, I repeat myself, but just don't get it inside the iris foliage. So recommended feeding time, obviously spring and fall. Um, in the spring, we, we say when the crocus bloom. Now for us in zone eight, it's mid-February. It may be, you know, end of March for some people. Um, and then we say feed in the fall. And again, for zone eight, that's typically between Halloween and maybe mid-November. So these are some examples of the alpha code. The picture has 14, 14, 14, but if you can find 10, 10, 10, that's obviously a better choice. And then the one on the right is a favorite. Um, we used to get it at Walmart all the time. And most recently, we have found 888 at the bigger box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot here. Um, all fertilizer is expensive. I don't care what you're going to, what garden center, whatever. So, you know, it's, it's like gold to us. So, you know, we don't use a lot of the fertilizer because it's not like the more you use, the better you are. Just you know, keep it all in perspective. So I get questions, okay, so if I plant the irises uh, the way I should, and if I fertilize the way I should, and I water the way I should, and I weed the gardens like I should, then what could possibly happen? And with anything, you know, there's another side of the story. So there are various diseases that affect our bearded irises. Um, that could be scorch, which we're going to see some examples of. That could be leaf spot. And then I capitalized rot because that's the thing that, that bugs us, I think, probably the most um, is the rot within the irises. And then while it's not a disease, um, bloom out may be something that could go wrong. Um, sometimes that's weather related for us if it does not get uh, cold enough. But that's when your rhizome does not have any increases. Now, it may send up a bloom stalk, but if there's no increase, then that's the end of the road. And sometimes that um, rhizome is called a light bulb due to the, the shape of the rhizome. So let's talk about scorch. Um, scorch is caused by an infection of the phytoplasma, which is a type of bacteria. And the bacteria can only live inside uh, vessels inside the plant and the saliva glands of insects. And the insects, obviously, are the transmitters. So one suggestion for scorch would be a heating of the plant of 104 degrees for a few days. Um, for us in Texas, we can get 104 degrees for multiple days. I, I haven't seen that particular method work for us, but it may. Things like whether it's rot or scorch or anything, it's always your favorite iris, the iris you paid the most money for, or one that you just really, really, really wanted to see for the first time. You know, that seems to always be the case with me. But um, I want to show you a picture of scorch and kind of give you an idea about what you might do to try to save it. Now, this poor guy here, um, pretty, pretty far gone, um, but I always see the good side, so I see a little bit of green here, a little bit of green here, maybe a little bit here. At this point, you have nothing to lose. 
So I would probably try to quarter this. I would put some root tone on the wound where I've cut. I would put this in four separate pots and see if I can get it to grow. You know, you never know. You might. Um, and if you do, you might save a portion of it and, you know, it's all for the better. But if you leave it like this, um, it has no place to go other than down. So let's talk about leaf spot. Um, leaf spot is annoying and it's unsightly. Um, it's a fungus, it's not a bacteria, it's a fungus. And the spores of the fungus live in the soil. So it's critical that you get in the springtime and you know in the fall, leaves and old uh, debris and everything away again from the base of the plant. Now you can spray a fungicide like ventilate early in the season. Um, or you can, we, we choose not to do anything with it in, in our garden because, you know, you can, you can go out there one day and everything is fine and then it seems like you go the very next day and overnight you have leaf spot. And we get leaf spot primarily when it's been very wet, just very wet and then it's warming up. Um, but it doesn't hurt the plant. Like I said, it just looks kind of icky. But then as new foliage comes on, once it dries out and it's warm, warming up, then the leaf spot will go away. But you can choose that you can use a fungicide and, and go ahead and, and pre-treat it. So these are two examples of leaf spot. Um, this particular iris here is quite consumed with the leaf spot. Um, this one, not as much, but definitely, you know, begins dying from the top turns kind of yellow here than all the spotting that you see. Now, if possible, I like to trim this off and again, just remove it, just get it away from the garden. Here you can see some dried leaves and so forth. Uh, get that away from the plant so you're removing those fungus spores away. So let's talk about my unfavorite topic and that's bacterial soft rot. You know it, you can smell it, it's icky, it's slimy, it's any, anything you want to describe it as. And again, it seems to affect the, my most favorite plant. Um, but anyway, um, iris borers or a wound in the rhizome sometimes provides entry of the bacteria. For us, when it's, when it's very wet and it's very warm, I think that also introduces rot into the irises. So again, the object of the game is remove all the infected tissue, just remove it. And I'm gonna show you an example here. So the example on the left, they're using a knife and they're cutting away all of the infected tissue here. Um, you don't wanna leave it here on the ground, you wanna get it away from the plant because it's still active and you do not want to transmit that to another plant. And you can see all this rot that's on this knife here. So once you get uh, complete with doing this, if you need to go doctor another um, iris, you want to wash this in bleach and a bacterial soap. You want to do everything you can to get this um, instrument clean, again, so you don't transmit this to the next iris. So things that might help for bacterial rot. Um, many years ago in the Dallas area, we were able to purchase um, streptomycin. Uh, Agrostrep, and it was in a powder form, and we would not dilute it, but we'd put that directly on the tissue after you know it had been uh, the bad tissue had been removed. You can't buy that any longer. So what has some of the active ingredients is Fertilone Fire Blight Spray. Um, it's in a little three ounce I think container. Um, you can buy it for it's pricey because it's about twelve to fifteen dollars. Um, but you can apply that to the wound once you've cleaned out the uh, infected tissue. Always use gloves, always, always, when you're applying any type of chemical or any type of uh, ingredient like this. Sometimes that will work. Now, this spring, uh, we had some rot in the garden, and I tried, uh, the first thing I tried was Comet in Ajax because it has a bleach type um, ingredient and it didn't stop it and the next time I tried 
uh, bleach 10 to 1 ratio with water, and that didn't stop it. And then I tried 5 to 1 ratio, and that didn't stop it. And I had a couple of plants that I was going to lose anyway. So what I did was I took just the cap off the bleach and filled it, and I think that's about a tablespoon, tablespoon and a half of bleach. And I applied it directly to the infected part of the rhizome once I had removed the tissue, the infected tissue. And for the most part, I saved them. What I didn't realize was early on before I figured this out was the rhizome looked like it was fine. But when you press on the rhizome, uh, you could tell it was all gushy and bacterial rot was already involved. So I do not recommend you spraying your garden with bleach. I'm not saying that. And I don't believe in infecting your garden uh, with bleach. But you could dig that rhizome, put it in a pot, put new soil in, and then apply the bleach. And you've controlled where you have uh, used the bleach in your garden. Now, I mentioned dial antibacterial soap. I'm not a chemist. I just do this for, for me. But I have to understand that Dial changed their formula several years ago and changed some of the ingredients. And for us, it has a very limited impact on the bacterial rot now. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I can tell you it doesn't work as effectively as it did. So another, I mentioned Comet, Ajax, Zud, anything like that that's got a bleach element in it. Um, clean out the infected tissue and apply this directly on that rhizome. This was just a picture I had of the bloom out. Um, you can see I've got a nice stalk that's coming up here, um, but there are no new plants around the stalk. So again, sometimes I'll go to what extreme I possibly can to save something. And once this stalk blooms, I will try to cross onto that and try to create a seed pod and force Mother Nature into preserving that plant and giving me an increase. It has limited success, but at this point I have nothing to lose because once this bloom stalk, this blooms and I cut this off at the base, I have nothing left. Now let's talk about some pests. Um, aphids and thrips, early in the season we know, you know, whether it's daylilies are on or irises, you know, they're they're just removing all the sap from the plant. Um, you can either use something that would kill the aphids or you can, you know, I'm talking out of one side of my mouth and then the other, you can spray water on them, you know, to try to get rid of them. But um, they can do damage to the bloom and, you know, to the foliage and everything. There are bores. Now, we do not have the boars here so far so good um, because it does get so hot. But they can wreak a lot of havoc with irises. So, you know, whether you're trying to organically take care of the situation or uh, control it through chemicals, um, they can create quite an issue and actually just go all the way down into the rhizome and ruin the iris. Cutworms are a huge problem. Um, they feed toward the end of the day, in the evening. Um, I've got them all different sizes, all different stripes, whatever. Um, you know, if you choose, you can use something like bio worm. Um, but when you do, you know, you kill the good worms too. So again, I just try to kill as many of them as I can, get them away from my irises, keep my irises clean around the base, you know, um, and that they can they can wreak havoc on the stalks and the plant. So while they're not a pest necessarily, they are a pest. Uh, birds and squirrels. Um, the birds are attracted to some of the insects that are on the uh, irises, so they can either uh, peck in the blooms or peck the the uh, buds, uh, but they can cause some damage to your irises. But for us, it's primarily the Mockingbird, and since that's our state flower, uh, state bird rather, I'm sorry, um, probably there's nothing I can do about that. So anyway, I just kind of shoo them off and, and hopefully they'll go to some other plant. And then there's the squirrels. And the squirrels like to dig up our rhizomes. They like to move them around for us. Um, they can cause some, some havoc. So hopefully um, you can do something just to discourage them from being in your iris garden. 
So this is just some pictures of Thrip on the right, some aphids on the left, and Mrs. Ladybug is doing everything she possibly can to eat as many aphids as possible. So you can use aphids in your garden organically to control some of the pests. Um, again, the cutworm, um, I don't know how fast that they can drill through an iris stalk, but I think it's pretty fast. Um, because, again, you can go out there in the evening, everything's fine. You go out there in the next morning, and there's your iris stalk just laying on the ground or your iris fan. So they're, they're pretty obnoxious. So there are other things that um, aren't bad things, but it's unusual things that I get asked questions about. This is called a proliferation. And if you'll notice, here's your stalk. And then at the top of that stalk, there's a plant here, and there's a plant here. And if you look very, very closely, you can see tiny, tiny little roots coming from the bottom. Now, I will cut this off at the base. I will split this stalk, and I'll put some root tone on it. Again, if you use a root tone, always use your gloves. And then you can pot these. And just, you know, the one-gallon pot with some potting soil. And I go ahead and trim the leaves back because, again, I'm shocking the plant. And you will have two new plants. So it's a great way to get extra new plants when you see a proliferation. Hey, take advantage of it. Consider yourself fortunate. And that's just two more plants that you didn't have earlier. Um, it will be the very same as the mother plant. So you won't get another color or design or something. Sometimes in the early spring, if it heats up for us and then it cools down quickly, uh, this is what happens. The stalk begins to emerge, it gets cold again, and it stops. And wherever it got cold, it stops. And the result is a beautiful bloom on about a four inch stalk. And that's just what it is. When I see something like this, just go ahead and sever it here at the base and, you know, there's always next year. That's the only way you can think about it. Now, this is what we call pineappling here. It's coming right off of that mother rhizome. Now, the good news is, look at this. From this rhizome, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I mean, I've got great, you know, increase here. But I will not get a bloom this year here because once this pineappling starts, now, it's not every year on every plant. Um, again, for us, we believe it's more weather-related. This is another example. You know, I've got some great growth here, but this abnormal growth right here, again, um, we're just going to lose the bloom this year. Um, I think this is also a good example. You can see where the top of the rhizome is exposed above the soil line. This happens to be a Louisiana iris, but you can also see this on the bearded irises. This is called pleating. And there's nothing wrong with your plant. It's very healthy. Again, this is weather extremes. It's got very warm, and you call it a rapid growth of the foliage here. So it's actually kind of pretty. It's very interesting, I think. Um, again, will it happen every year on every plant? No, it's just those extreme weather variances. And then I've got questions about why are my irises not blooming. And we talked a little bit about this. Um, but if irises have not been dug and divided in several years, they do become very overcrowded and they decrease their bloom. Or they're planted in too much shade. So we'll take a look at that. This is an iris clump that's been dug. It's very healthy, um, <clears throat> but it does need to be dug. Um, still got the bloom stalks attached to it, but this will be divided. So these are all plants that will come off of this rhizome. Um, the old uh, mother plant or rhizome here uh, will be removed um, unless there's little small plants. And I save every little bit of a rhizome. My husband can tell you that um, because I just see, I hate to see anything go to waste. So when you're digging iris clumps, Get you a nice sharp uh, shovel and dig all the way around the plant and lift it. Uh, remove the excess dirt and again discard 
uh, probably that old mother rhizome or the center rhizome unless there's um, some new growth on it. And then this is an example of, while it's very attractive planting, uh, you're going to get very limited bloom because these irises are way too, too much shade here. I get asked if it's important to keep the names of irises, and that's an overwhelming yes, um, because if you are going to enter an American Iris Society sanctioned show, you have to know the registered name of your iris. Um, and, you know, there's some of them, there, if they're white or they're blue or they're yellow, you know, some of them, you know, really look similar, so you'd want to make sure you keep your name. And then also, if you keep a garden chart, your list of your list of your irises, then hopefully, when you go to a show or a sale or something like that where they're selling irises, you wouldn't repurchase the very same iris again. Now, have I done that? Sure, I've done that. But anyway, you would hope that um, that would help you uh, buy more irises of different kinds. So, how do you keep track of iris names? Um, well, first of all, the least expensive way that I have found is um, you just buy your box of plastic knives and then write the name of the iris on both sides of the knife with a pencil. And you might think, but a Sharpie is so much easier to see. Well, y'all yeah, right today it is, but once it fades, um, then you're not going to be able to read your name. So you're going to be very disappointed. So just be sure you bear down hard with your pencil, but write on both sides. Now, you can get a more expensive metal tag, uh, which works very nice, and you can get Avery weatherproof shipping label. Just be sure you use a laser printer and don't use an inkjet. I've done that, and then you can't read your name because the ink runs on the inkjet. So this is an example of a metal, metal tag. You can get uh, as much information on here as you want. So Royal Dagger is the name of that iris. It is an IB, that's an intermediate bearded, so that's one with a, a smaller stalk blooming early. It is an RE, that's rebloomer, which is quite nice. And then we tell, it, tell us that it's an FA, that means space age. So that means that there is an appendage uh, coming up from the end of the beard. This is another type of marker that you could get. It's quite nice. Um, here, again, in the garden, you can choose just to put the name of the iris on there, put the hybridizer. It's your garden, so however you want to, to put your labels on, it's fine. Now, this is PVC pipe with a paint pen. This is obviously a wood stake that you can buy at the hardware store, and again, with a paint pen. This is another type. This is from um, Paw Paw. Uh, markers and we use those and they do very very well in the garden again the name of the iris hybridizer and year of introduction into commerce so we talked a little about about if you entered an AIS sanctioned show then you need to know the name so let's let's look at a little bit of the irises that we might see that we take to the show so this one I said this is the terminal bud so this is the first bud that's going to open and I said it would open in X days because just from this photo, I really can't tell because if the nights are pretty cool, this could stay very tight, just like a rose would. This could stay very tight for several days. If it's warm in the evening, if you've got sunshine during the day, this right here might open in one or two days. But it's one to watch for if you're coming up maybe the week of your show. You always want to select irises with good branching for the show. While this is a Louisiana iris, you can see it's a nice straight stalk. That's what you want. And then where should I cut the stalk? Now, if you were going to cut this stalk for a display at your house or to enter a show and, you know, it's too tall, you might cut it here. Well, when you do that, um, you're going to allow water, you're going to allow insects, you're going to allow everything to come down the stalk and possibly introduce rot. So I always tell people, sever this at the, at the base. Do not break that stalk out because you're gonna damage more of the, the, the tissue and damage your plant. So use a very sharp knife and just sever that at the base. Always, again, pick an iris that has good bloom and good branch. 
Um, you can go to iris gardens in the spring, see different irises that you might want to purchase in the fall. But look for something that has good branching. Look for something like this is going to have two or three open on the same day, but it's got extra buds. So you've got buds here that's coming on, buds here. You know, there's probably a bud in here. So you, you want to make sure that you've got enough iris blooms uh, to last you for, for several weeks. So this one, you know, now I, I think it would win um, if I can get it to the show without breaking one of the blossoms off. So I would sever this at the base. I'd be very, very careful with this one because it's got three open. So it's got one here, it's got one here, it's got one here. They're perfectly spaced. So, you know, that could be best of show again, but I've got to transport it and get it to the show in great condition. Oh, sorry. So this little guy here, um, the name of it is Little Freak, but that's not the way it typically branches. Um, but this one was going toward the sun, and they will do that. So this little guy, even if he was blooming, I wouldn't be able to take him to the show. I'd just leave him at home and enjoy it in the garden. So let's talk a little bit about maybe making new irises. I'm a hybridizer. My husband is a hybridizer. It's a lot of fun, especially in the spring, to go out there and see your seedlings bloom for the very, very first time. Because nobody on earth has got to see that iris bloom first other than you. So, you know, you might be dreaming of, I know I dream of, maybe a, a black face age iris with like white flounces or a tomato red flatty. I mean, you, I, you wouldn't make a ton of money, but oh my gosh, you'd be the first one on the market with something like this. So. That might be your dream of, if I'm making Irish crosses, this is what I hope to get. Now, you might select one seedling out of 150 um, of your cross, so that's a pretty low percentage um, that might be introducible to commerce. But once you make your cross to when you get to see it the first time, could be several years. So you have to be in this for the long haul, but hybridizing is fun, and it's, it's it's just a lot, a lot of fun to see your first seedling. So my husband is my model, and he is at our house, and he's crossing his Louisiana irises. And you can see my blue bonnets are, are still well in bloom here. And this same guy you now is sitting down on the job, but he's crossing the little SDBs. And remember I told you in the landscape, you'd use your little small SDBs at the front, and then you graduate up to your taller irises. So he's making a cross there. And again, we don't put the pollen on the beard. That might be the most logical place you want to put it, but that would not be where you would put it. But you can see in here, right under, this is the style crest, and right underneath it here is where the pollen resides. So we're going to take that pollen, and you can see the pollen on his finger, and we're gonna put that on the stigmatic lip of this iris. So we're making our cross um, in this photo. Again, uh, while we've got three of the stigmatic lips, uh, some people uh, believe that you can just cross on one and you're fine. If you've got enough pollen, we go ahead and cross on all three. Now, once you've made your cross, and uh, we just use um, paper tags you can get at the office supply place. But you want to write the name of the pod parent, and that's what the pollen went on to, which is this one. And then what was the pollen parent? Where did you get that pollen from? What was the name of that iris, or what was the name of that seedling? And then you'll put that information on your tag. And then in a several weeks, you know, you're going to see pods that are developing here. And they get larger. And this particular hybridizer uses uh, strips of fabric and writes on the uh, fabric with a like a paint pen or a magic marker or something like that, the name of the cross. And you can see there's like all of these crosses were made on this one iris stalk. And you can see it's staked because these pods get quite heavy at times. Again, more pods, and there was two blooms that was in that um, socket, so both of those were crossed. This is a Louisiana uh, 
crossed. I want you to see the round seed pods compared to the more elongated seed pods. Now these pods are, are getting very ripe because you can see now they're a light green, almost uh, a kind of a pale green. And then these are ready for harvest. Actually this one here, past harvest, because these little red things are the seeds that you see there. So I have to pick this right now. So you can see our cross is labeled here. And then this is the open seed pod, and you can see the chambers where these seeds were. So every one of these seeds are good viable seeds that will be dried. So when we collect the seeds, our, just our method, and there's lots of different ways you can do this, but our method is you would put the seeds in a little styrofoam cup, a little coffee cup you can buy at the dollar store. You write the name of your cross on here. So the pod parent was Dale Yost and the uh, pollen parent was Tropical Cooler. And you can see the nice, nice seeds here. Just make sure you don't put them in a plastic bag because they'll collect moisture and, and could possibly ruin your seeds. And then when we'll wait, we'll let the seeds mature, dry, and then we'll plant them in black plastic pots. Now, the markers we use for this, since we need a lot of them, um, you can find Venetian blinds, the metal ones. Sometimes people throw them away or you'll find them at the thrift store or something. And you just cut them in like six inch strips and then write on them with, again, pencil, not magic marker or not Sharpie, but pencil. So all of this is probably one seed pod or if there was a lot of seeds, we would have divided it out. So these will continue to grow when they get about mm, nine, 10 inches, I guess. Then we will tap them out of the pot and separate each one of them. So if you've ever planted onion sets, this is just as much fun as that because they're tiny, tiny little plants and you wanna make sure that you keep each of the crosses separate. Uh, this is a picture of our friend Tom Bursting in Grand Prairie, Texas. And Tom uses cinder blocks to plant his seeds. So each one of these cinder blocks houses a particular pod or, or a seed. Then you can see they also make a nice liner for his pathway at his garden. And then you can see the little iris plants here that are already coming up. And when they get to a certain level, then he'll take a garden spade, remove them from the, the cinder block, and then line them out in the garden. So in summary, I always tell people, um, just dream big, you know, uh, your iris garden is your iris garden. And however you wanna plant it um, is perfect. So here are some examples. I mean, you may do just a few, you may do them all of the same variety, which is fine. You can see they're in, in good soil, there's no debris or anything around them. Um, you could grow um, a garden at your house, I mean, all the way out to the curb. You know, it makes great curb appeal for uh, visitors. You can, this particular garden backs up to a golf course. And, you know, they're planting inside their fence and they're planting outside. People love to come by and see these plants on the outside. This is the same garden, but I want you to see the graduation of the different types of irises. So you've even got a few Louisiana irises here that are already blooming with the tall bearded. This is uh, where you could just row your irises. This was one of the convention plantings um, in Addison when we hosted the national convention several years ago. Uh, this is a picture of a commercial garden, Mr. Bursting's garden in Grand Prairie. Again, you know, just long rows of irises. A lot of these are his seedlings, but just long rows of irises. Can you imagine? And then a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar uh, that are on the call with this garden. This is Shriners. You have beautiful columbine. They've got rhododendrons. They, you know, it's just, it's just paradise. Uh, beautiful lupins that they're able to grow. But I want you to see this. They're on somewhat of raised bed. No debris whatsoever in here. They've used companion plants. Uh, they're keeping the grass away from it very nicely. Uh, everything is well manicured. And then again, this is just another shot of Shriners. Uh, the alum that they have blooming, again, the rhododendrons, 
the peonies are here. Um, so again, it's your garden. So, you know, you make it the way you want to do it. I know you'll be successful. Irises are a lot of fun. I absolutely never even remember not having irises growing up as a kid. So I've had fun with this and I hope you have had fun. And that's the end of our program. Andy? Thank you, Bonnie. And now we're going to read you some questions. Um, Claire okay. um, is going to do that first. first. First, I just want to say, Bonnie, very nice. You did a great job on this. Thank All right, you. Here's, my, here's the first question. This comes from Jane Jordan. She asks, should the soil be treated after a plant has had scorch? Um, what I would suggest that I do is I would dig the entire clump, get it away from the rest of the plants. I would dig out several uh, spades of dirt. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go off the deep end and go down three or four feet and everything, but the, the immediate soil around there, yes, I would remove that just, uh, just because. And the next question I have is, will diatomaceous earth work on cutworms and that's from lisa kudrick i have not tried uh dimacious earth i think that they they might so i think it's definitely well worth exploring and i could ask this question too it's again from lisa kudrick she asks how long from gathering a seed from a pod until you see it bloom Depends on where you live, um, but for us, the crosses we made in the spring of 2020, um, we will see some bloom in 2022, um, but most of the bloom will be in 2023. So when anyone says, oh my gosh, that new iris is $50, well, it's about uh, 10 years of your life because once it blooms that first year, you're going to be able to tell, okay, it's going to be an orange iris, or it's going to have stripes, or it's going to be whatever. But you really don't have a good idea about how outstanding is the branching going to be, um, what is the typical number of buds that it's going to have, and what are its growth habits. You know, is it going to have healthy foliage? Is it going to have uh, nice, tall, straight stalks? So you've got to evaluate that. And another way you can evaluate that is hybridizers send their seedlings to national conventions. And we saw lots of great irises when we were in California uh, for the last convention. And we were able to see people's seedlings and then people evaluate those and give feedback to the hybridizer. And the hybridizer also knows how their irises grow because you want an iris that's going to grow very well across the US and overseas. You don't want one that's very temperamental, they will only grow in this particular climate. So it, it, while it's 50 or $55 for a brand new introduction of an iris, um, you know, a lot of work goes into it and you don't have to buy it that first year. Just let it be on the market a few years and they decrease in value and in price and then, you know, more people can, can have the iris. Okay, another question. This one is from Linda Friedman. She asks, do iris leaves need to be cut back in the fall? The only time that I cut the foliage, in, unless I'm transplanting. Now, if I'm transplanting, yes, I always cut the foliage back. Um, but the only time if, if the irises begin to look a little, you know, they're dried or they've had some leaf spot, then yes, I'll do everybody a favor and I'll, I'll cut the foliage back, but I know some people say, oh, I just mow my irises down every summer and I just cringe because that's a little bit extreme, you know, um, but I definitely, I just leave them. And, you know, if you know me personally, you know, I don't cut my irises uh, very often. I do for a show and I only cut them for a show if I have multiple stalks because I enjoy them in the, in the garden. So I also enjoy the foliage because Let's be honest with each other. We see the foliage on irises more than we see the bloom season. Whether, you know, yeah, you, we're getting repeat bloom right now, but 
um, you so you want that foliage to look healthy all the time. So if healthy is trimming it back so it looks better in your garden, then I would go ahead and do it. And then I have another question here. Which iris will grow best in containers? Mm, well, the, the bearded will, will grow. They will live. They won't be as happy. Um, you know, a lot of people grow beardless Louisiana irises um, in containers like big plastic tubs. Um, my husband grows some in the big plastic tubs because sometimes they, they're more invasive and they run over my daylilies. But um, most of the bearded irises, um, you can go ahead and pop them and let them grow maybe a year. But past that, the size of the rhizome begins to diminish and you will see a realistic difference in the bloom. So I would not pot any of the bearded irises. Okay. I think Gary has some questions for you. Hi, Gary. Yeah, Gar Gary was recording some of the questions. So um, go ahead, Gary, and, and Claire, if you can pick up the rest of the questions from, yes. Hi, Bonnie. Yeah, the first one I have is uh, Lisa asks, can you solarize the soil to get rid of scorch? Um, you probably could. Um, I have not personally had any experience with it because um, we're very fortunate that we don't see a lot of scorch. Um, you know, you'll have some years, you'll see a little bit more, um, but until that becomes a huge issue, um, no, I have not done any solarization. Okay. And then the next question is uh, from Frank uh, Russenberger, and he asks, uh, uh, it says, after a bloom is hand pollinated, is there a concern that an insect pollinator may visit the same bloom and do its own hybridizing and mess up yours? Well, um, I think particularly on the beardless irises, the Louisiana and the Spuria, I think lots of times you're kidding yourself if you can beat the bees out there. Um, many times with the, with the bearded irises, uh, you could ex go to an extreme and you could remove all of the, the falls and the standards and you know just leave the essential parts. I know Tom Bursting does that um, to make sure that no other insect or bee or something is gonna land on and they need the petals and maybe um, accidentally do some pollinating themselves. Or what you could do is you could cover that uh, bloom once maybe with um, some sort of stocking or something like that or net um, so you can keep the insects away from it um, to make sure that you do get a true crawl. I don't do that, um, but just basically because I'm in a hurry and, and I don't have that much time, but you could. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Diane asks um, or says, about a month ago, all the buds disappeared from one plant without any other damage to the rest of the plant. Nearby plant was undamaged. Could that be squirrels? Could be birds. I know for the National Convention at that one garden I showed you, um, I believe that I had cutworms over there because they had uh, something had drilled through every one of the buds and were in the buds and they were on the ground and everything else. And it turned out it was the state bird. It was the mockingbirds that were doing it, not the you know not anything else. So it it probably could have been some kind of varmint. Um, that likes your particular iris. Okay. Um, and then uh, she also asked, uh, says uh, uh, a few of her iris kids have some chartreuse leaves. Is that a problem? And she's in, uh, looks like zone uh, six. I'm not sure. Um, is it just any particular time of the year, maybe spring or fall that she's seeing that? Um, I'd have to see a picture. If yeah. I could see a picture, I'd be happy to help her. Okay, we'll check on that. Um, and then I don't know if there's other questions that uh, Claire has. Yes. Yeah, I do. Yes. There, there. Are, do you want to do them, Andy? No, no. Go ahead. You... What's that? Go ahead. Well, I have. Um, after a bloom is hand pollinated, 
Oh, you already did that one. In zone nine, this is a different question. In zone nine, the minis seem to do best in pots. So this wasn't really a question. Jill Spady is in zone nine. And uh, here's a question. Should tall beardeds be planted covered with dirt or with the rhizome floating at ground level? Definitely with the tall bearded, I would make sure that the top part of the rhizome is exposed. Whatever we do, do not plant that too deep with the entire rhizome below the uh, soil level, because when you do water, um, then you do encourage rot. Now, for zone nine, kind of answering that question, the Louisiana irises do very, very well in zone nine. Um, whether that be Florida or South Texas or anything along the coast. Um, so rather than the bearded irises, because even, even potting the bearded irises, um, you just don't get cold enough. Thank you for watching this video by the American Iris Society. Please subscribe to our channel and don't forget to click on the little bell that will notify you when the next video is posted.